today's going to be an exciting episode. In order to grow, you need systems. We never took any money. We never took any business classes. <laughs> we hit stagnancy. We suddenly realized that we were really disorganized and we needed more structure and clarity. Welcome to another episode of the How to Hide a Dead Body podcast with myself, Ice Rudansky, founder and CEO of Adventure Media, Patrick Gilbert, Adventure Media's executive director, and Danielle Immerman, our queen of content. Thanks for joining us. Today's going to be an exciting episode. We have a lot to cover. We're going to talk about org charts and hierarchies and management styles and all sorts of interesting things. Just to kick things off, a few days ago, Patrick sent a company-wide email, slide deck, accompanying, accompanying video, um, titled State of the Union. And in it, Patrick outlined a lot of principles that are going to be implemented to spearhead our company's growth through through this transitionary period that we're in, which we'll talk about. To give some context, we, Adventure Media bootstrapped um, our agency. We never took any money. We never took any business classes. <laughs> um, we really just focused on doing good work. And that was a fun environment. And it still is a fun environment. And we hit a, um, we hit stagnancy in that model which was basically a bring on really highly intelligent people that were obstinate, irreverent, highly creative, highly intelligent, nearly impossible to manage, difficult to hold accountable, and um, have them do good work. And that's really fundamentally our model. And in order to grow, you need systems. And it's not an easy thing to figure out how to put these types of people into systems, which are people who fundamentally find systems anathema to their nature. Uh, and I'm just speaking for myself also, like I'm not a systems guy. So Patrick, what did you identify? At what point did you see like what we have going is great, but not something which could sustain a larger architecture? Um, as the company grows in volume, as our revenue grows, as the client pool grows, what were the problems you were identifying? Um, and at what point did the problems become apparent enough that made you realize, okay, we need a lot of work, we need a lot of thinking, we need systems, and then w how did you go about thinking about and designing some of the systems that, that you've built? Sure. It's difficult to articulate a, a singular point or an event that triggered any of this. It's sort of just like an ongoing process. Uh, as part of the State of the Union, I made the comparison that my experience at Adventure Media has very much felt like the plot of The Dark Knight, which is basically just like one long climactic experience. There's not actually a traditional plot arc of that movie where it's just constantly chaos uh, and it's very exciting and very awesome. And that's how I, I, I feel. But really it, it sort of came to a head around the end of 2020 and it was an important juncture for us i think of all of society it felt like we were moving on from what was a very hectic and weird year and we also felt that impact as a business but beyond that beyond all the things that were happening in the world there was a lot of things that were sort of coming together um toward the end of last year so for one my book came out uh, at the end of November, which wrapped up basically the main project that I had been working on for more, more than a year. So if you were to say, what's the most important thing that's going on right now, I would have answered that that's, that that's actually what's taking up most of my time. By the way, if you guys don't have a copy of the book, pick it up on amazon.com, Join or Die, Digital Advertising in the Age of Automation. It's one of the best selling, number one best selling books in the digital marketing category worldwide. Um, if you look at the reviews, you'll be astounded by what people are saying. So I, sh I don't need to say any more. Join or die, digital advertising in the age of automation, available in hardcover, softcover, and audiobook on Amazon.com. <laughs> I love, I love the intermediate ad read for. <laughs> Thanks, Isaac. So, so that was number one. Number two is that throughout 2020, we had a number of different senior team members that were out on maternity leave, and they all overlapped with one another. So it, it kind of felt like we were in a bit of a holding pattern, waiting to have everyone back and be at full capacity. The third thing was that um, another one of our senior team members, Ari, was going to be leaving uh, the, the, the company to pursue another opportunity. And he was a big piece of our team. So we kind of had to figure out like how we were going to fill his shoes at that time. The fourth thing was we were starting to put the pieces in place for 
what would eventually become our analytics department. It was a, a really large venture that we had talked about for a long time, and we wanted to start pursuing this weird type of new project. And then finally, I think you, Isaac, spent a lot of, you were spending a lot of your time throughout 2020, and, and since then, um, working on a few different key partnerships and larger client projects that were taking up a great deal of your time. So I think as we looked ahead into 2020, we were looking around, like all like things were wrapping up. There was a lot of unanswered questions about where we had to go from here. People were asking us, what are your 2020 goals? And we were like, I have no idea what I'm trying to do next week, never mind over the course of this year. And if you take a step back, our team grew substantially in terms of sheer quantity of people here uh, over the last two years. And I think we suddenly realized that we were really disorganized and we needed more structure and clarity. There were things that used to work well and used to like be a part of our culture that were just kind of second nature that were starting to fall apart. So we started this process of basically saying like, hey, look, we have a lot of like warts and issues that we need to start to address. And that's basically been the main topic over the last six months. So walk us through your thought process around org charts and why you thought that this would be a good direction to go in as far as, as like before you get to the detail of the org chart or different systems, like what really made it clear to you that this was the right direction? It was a lot easier when we were a smaller team and everybody just shared responsibilities. Like you don't have to worry so much about what somebody's title or their job function is when it's just like five to 10 people, everyone has like a similar type of role and you can just hack your way to success. Um, and that sort of culture, that environment is exciting and it's fun, but I made the mistake of thinking that structure and process would be a hindrance to our culture. You mentioned that you're sort of anti-process. I mean, I think that's that's what a lot of entrepreneurs would, would probably agree with you. And I, I fall in line with that as well. Like I've always kind of looked away from your traditional management structure. I've, I've always thought that that's kind of um, not my ideal working environment. And I thought that that lack of defined structure was what made us great. It allowed us to do great work. And it was a pretty terrible idea for me to have because all of a sudden we became 15 or 20 people and that loose structure of the team becomes a huge issue. You know, we started taking on like much more complicated client projects that required a lot of different skills. And we were lucky enough up until a point to have people that could have all of those skills. Um, and everybody on paper sort of had the same job title and function, but that's not a model that scales. So you mentioned earlier, we started, started, we started, we sort of started to plateau a little bit and that's because all of a sudden you bring on a really talented team member and expect them to be able to do everything, but that's not the reality of what this person's bringing to the table. They're bringing a unique set of skills that will help you take that next step, but they, they're not going to do what those first five or 10 employees did. And that's really how you grow as a company by bringing on more specialized individuals. Um, and it's really hard. Like the, the only way that that could ever work is by putting a lot of structure and process in place. Um, and then that goes into, okay, well, what are we even doing here? What does the org chart look like? So what does the org chart look like? What did it look like before? Um, and, and what is the ultimate goal? And wh where, what is the aim of an org chart now? Like in the, in the direction that we're heading? So historically, I think there's been, like you're at the top, and then there's basically been this loose, like business development side or sales side of the business. And then there's been client services, which basically does the work for our clients. Um, and, and I was in a position where I, I managed that team. So there was a little bit of structure, but basically everyone that we brought on, even people that had different roles. So like we've had, um, CRO specialists come, you know, that, that have joined our team over the years, they just technically fell under the role of a client services type of person. Um, and it was always very confusing, but we just sort of dealt with it. Then all of a sudden we bring on someone like Danielle, who's going to be doing content, who's not really responsible for managing client work. She's doing something else. And we have a bunch of other team members now that aren't really that traditional account manager role. So we tried to piece these things together. And I, I think I, it started with saying, okay, well, who are the people that we want to have the most influence across the entire organization? 
uh, Jim Collins, right? Jim Collins um, wrote Good to Great, I don't know, a hundred years ago at this point. And it's, I reference it all the time, but one of the key principles of Good to, good to Great is that you need to first get the right people on the bus and then you figure out where the bus is going. And that's something that we've always believed in. Our goal has always been, hey, look, these people are super smart, they're super talented, and they're passionate about you know the sort of work that we do. Let's bring them here, and then we'll figure out what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be making this valuable. And we started to say, okay, well, um, these certain these individuals here have been have have grown into a leadership role. Like it's not on paper. Like they're not a manager or they're not a director, but everyone looks to them for help. Everyone looks to them to set the tone for guidance, for, for how to handle certain situations. So they've, um, like not non-officially, but sort of in a way become the leaders within the company that are helping drive the organization forward. So, okay, let's legitimize that. And I think one of the first things that we did was, um, we figured out that we wanted somebody to lead up what would eventually become known as our strategy department. So uh, we wanted to have a group of people that were specifically, uh, their main goal is to figure out how to do our jobs well. And that sounds like a misnomer, but there's a lot of elements of the work that we do. Part of it is managing client relationships and doing technical things like reporting and web development and conversion tracking. But then there's like the other piece of it where it's like, okay, well, how do you do good advertising? How do you understand a client's goals and take their budget and turn into prof and turn it into profitable revenue? So that is sort of the goal of what we wanted a strategy department that didn't exist yet. And we have a team member, um, Nahama, who we basically brought in and said, listen, we want you to be the VP of strategy, which is something that we have no idea what that means or what that entails or what strategy even means, but over the next six weeks, can you help us figure that out? And she had expressed that she was looking for that sort of role. Um, and we had many conversations about this over the last couple months, couple years. So we just kind of figured it out together. So that was the first piece. And then everything kind of fell into place after that. We just started asking more questions, doing some thought exercises, and then eventually these things kind of fell into place. There's two things with um, an org chart that to me are interesting problems. One is theoretical, one's practical. I want to hear your thoughts. The theoretical one is accountability. And I was talking to Erica last night. We had a whole long conversation about this. We're like, accountability is often misconstrued with like hard work and they're, they're different things. Like, I feel we've always had a very poor culture of accountability, although we've always had a very strong culture of, of hard work. The people we have here are like, they're just hardworking people. Like they like to work. They fill their day with, with client work they, or other work. It's like, you know, it's just, it's just the only type of personality that will work in our culture. Like people who didn't have a sort of an innate work ethic that enjoyed working hard and working long hours and working extra, like it, it just didn't work out. But accountability is different. And accountability, in order to have accountability, or like what, well, what is accountability then? If accountability is not, are you getting your work done or are you working hard? Um, to me, accountability is a, 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 a almost clarity, a clarity of responsibility. It's if I come over to you and I ask you X, Y, and Z, will you have that information ready? Do you, do you take ownership of these projects and shepherding a project through, uh, in a, in a timeline that fits not with your like nature or personality structure, but with the company's ethos, like that works for the company. Like accountability is a different thing. And I think accountability is very hard to have in that, um, like the mushroom cloud work environment, which is, there's just a lot of really interesting work and it sort of falls on everybody's lap randomly. Um, and people pick up the different pieces and people get it done, but that, that creates, it's anti accountability. Cause like no one really has very clearly defined what you're specifically responsible for. And that goes back to structure and systems, which is antithetical in some way, but also important. It's antithetical to people's personalities, but also important for the organization to grow. So the first one is like, do you agree with that definition of accountability or do you have a different definition of accountability? How does an organizational structure, which to some extent creates a hierarchy of 
of power or a hierarchy of responsibilities? How does that create accountability and why is that healthy? The second piece is it's nice to like it's nice to like whiteboard out organizational structures, but at the end of the day you have person A who right now is a full client workload and okay, it's like this is that person's gonna be a, a great VP of strategy or a great director of client services or a great, you know, lead on analytics. But and that's nice in theory. But at the end of the day you have like six phone calls with clients this afternoon. You have, you know, a hundred different projects in your pipeline that need to get done for existing clients. We don't have somebody coming in tomorrow that's going to be trained. How do you start making transitions? Um, it's, it almost seems impossible. Like it's, it's just, you can't do it. Like, okay, I have an org chart. That's nice, but I can't do it because everyone has work to do. So how do you start making, how do you start taking practical steps to implement a, an org chart and get, you know, buy-in from the team without overwhelming everybody? And and at I mean at one point at some point you can't give people two roles be like okay you're the VP of strategy and you're also managing all your clients because that will get no one anywhere. You also can't just make somebody a VP of strategy, or give them a promotion or put them in some different place in the org chart and not change their job description because then it's just um, decorative. Uh, and and like what I was getting like. I started getting like anxious, which is like, okay, this is this is great, but now like ninety percent of our company is a VP of something. Who the hell's doing the work? You know, so like, there's a bunch. Anyway, so that's a couple questions. Yeah, definitely. So, I agree with your definition, um, although it was a pretty vague. It was still kind of vague and, and flowy definition. So we we can we can work on on what that actually means, but in terms of assigning responsibility so that you know who owns what, I think is really what it comes down to. Um, and you're responsible for this. And I think the there's a difference between ownership and execution. And that I think is something that we've struggled with in the past is really understanding the difference between those, these, those two terms. If you are accountable to something, or if you are accountable to something, it means that you own it. So I might, um, let's say Danielle owns this podcast. She's the owner of, of the podcast project. Um, ultimately, she's accountable for making sure that this project is successful. But she's not the only one executing all the different things that have to do with getting a podcast off the ground. There's prep, there's you and I, there's research, there's other people that help us edit and publish the podcast. So. Once you start to figure out that of, okay, what is the difference between ownership and execution, then some of the other things fall in line with accountability. Now, on where there are issues with accountability, um, I've mentioned the way I think about this is that there's three tiers or pillars of accountability that keep this in check. If there's an issue with accountability or ownership, then it's generally one of the three following things. The first is respect given to the person giving the directives. In this case, let's say it's a manager. So if, if, if someone doesn't respect their manager, um, then they're not going to do the things that they're being asked of. So, and that's a huge issue. Like if you don't have respect in your organization, then, then nothing else will work. Um, I think, I think we have respect in our organization. I think everyone here respects one another. And of course it goes both ways. It has to be earned. Um, but that's, that's number one. Number two is what I would refer to as a legitimate priority stack, which is there's always a million things going on and things will ultimately slip through the cracks. But um, if you have your priority stack optimized, then you just have to deal with that on an ongoing basis. If an emergency comes up, if the building goes on fire and you miss a client phone call, that's a legitimate reason to miss that client phone call. Um, so, but there's a balance between your, your, what should be your priority stack based on the goals of the company and the goals that, you know, you have individually, but also you have to toe the line between that and then letting those things become an excuse because when everyone is working on a million different things at once, there's always technically an excuse. If you're accountable to something and a deadline gets missed, you could always look at your manager and say, well, I don't know what to tell you, I've been doing all these other things, so I didn't have time to do X, Y, Z. You know, I didn't have time to meet that deadline. So is that is that because it was your actual priority or is that just an excuse in terms of like being off? Okay, fine. The third piece of it is um, 
whether or not you're, you're as an individual, you're, you have a, a, a misaligned or misinformation about what your priority stack should be. So if you don't have clarity about the company vision and the company goals, then it's likely that your priority stack will be out of whack and therefore everything with accountability falls apart. So in terms of like that definition that you described, I think it is on track. And I think if we, if we figure out, okay, well, who's accountable and who's actually executing, then all this other stuff can, can work together. The second piece of it is not to be held in, in terms of how to transition into this new ideal org chart. Yes, to your point, it does sound nice to whiteboard these things out, but you also have to deal with the reality of a transitionary period and an adjustment. And I think you need some sort of framework in place for like understanding what actually happens. So let's say the three of us here have these clearly defined roles and it's like, okay, well, you know, you're the one that's going to be leading the conversation on this podcast and you're going to be the one that's doing the interview and, and so on and so forth. The reality of it is we're all sort of sharing this together and it's okay to pass ideas back and forth and it's okay to share the execution um, responsibility. So that that's having a framework for saying, okay, we're all going to do this, but ultimately this person owns it. That's how you kind of transition there. The last piece that you mentioned was it's really hard to have people step into these new roles when they already have a full-time job. So Alex Lieberman, who is the uh, founder of the morning brew, has uh, he has a podcast called Founders Journal. And on one of those episodes, he talks about the concept of murky middle projects. And a murky middle project is something that is very important to the organization, but it's either early in the development phase or it's, it's generally temporary. So it, it doesn't warrant a full time person, it doesn't require full time attention all year round or a person's salary for that matter. So his example that he gives is that a holiday gift guide is something that requires um, a lot of attention for a few weeks out of the year, but it would be ridiculous to have somebody on the Morning Brew staff that they're there all year long and their only job is, is the, the holiday gift guide. So, but there's a paradox because these murky middle projects, for them to be successful, they require full-time attention. And they're generally given to somebody that already has a full-time job. So to your question, how do you do that? So there's two, there's two solutions to it. Number one is that management needs to develop playbooks for how these murky middle projects should be run um, with as clear direction as possible. So if it's the holiday gift guide, it's okay, well, on this date, you do this thing and, and here's the resources we tap into and here's the vendors that we use, here's the costs associated with it and here's the timelines for how we're gonna hit those deadlines. If you have these playbooks, then it's much easier to hand that to somebody that already has a full-time job and say, okay, well, now you're gonna go and do this. But the reality of it is, management does not have the time or the capacity to create playbooks for every murky middle project in an organization. So you have to rely on your team members to be very good project managers that can be held accountable, that can have their priority stack in place, and that can figure out legitimately and practically how to break all of these projects down and integrate them with what they currently have on their plate. So if you do both of those things at once, if your individual team members make a commitment to being better project managers, and if management commits to as much as possible developing playbooks for managing these projects, then you can actually succeed um, with in this murky middle type of uh, type of world. So all that together is much easier said than done, but that's a general way of thinking about how to hold accountability and make this transition into a new org chart. I think it's also important where as, as people are, you know, being held responsible and accountable for filling their role in an org chart, which is very different than just, you know, coming in, you're very smart, come in, do good work. It's like, okay, great. Like you'll do all the good projects that you're interested in and, and you'll be put in positions that perfectly reflect your, your skill set and your interests. The problem is now, or the challenge you're going, now we're putting you in a role. So there's still a great deal of autonomy and creativity within a role, but you're responsible now for also assuming the, the and taking responsibility for roles within that role, tasks, 
that you might not like and you might that might not be easy for you and it's also going to take a shift in, in how a person operates it's like you're not you don't have as much freedom to just go anywhere you'd like you have to develop a one the capacity to delegate the capacity to hold other people accountable the capacity to go to a team team member who's a friend and say like i need you to do this and that's like for a lot of people it's i mean it, it's an uncomfortable thing to say especially if you're basically non-confrontational and you have a high need for affiliation which most people have um you know like a low a low need for like you see a lot of like large enterprise ceos who have who rate a very rate on the personality index a very low need for affiliation it's a sort of a, a semi sociopathic character trait so people with a high need for affiliation it's like it's not comfortable to go over to somebody and say i need this done by this and this date and and say it in a way which is implying you're going to be, you're letting me down if you don't if you don't and cuz that opens up a person to a whole bunch of vulnerabilities like one is confrontation confrontation two is is tension it's conflict to some subtle way um so but people have to learn how to do that because you cannot be a manager you cannot you cannot grow in a competence hierarchy without the capacity to do that and to have that assertiveness which is not cruelty it's not like it's not confrontation it's assertiveness it's saying well, I I can't I was, you know I was talking to to uh, a couple of our team members about this recently about you know these long like the amount of hours spent just talking back and forth to different contractors and like it's at a certain point it's like not welcome to the family and let's let's you know be on a three week staycation it's we, you need this to we need this done this is not what we asked for like here's three bullets and I, I I'm looking forward to seeing the next you know revision by 5 p.m. And, you know, you just have to be able to say that and it's say that assertively. And it's true with all, all sorts of relationships. And people want that, I think. I think people want that feedback and, and people want to be, to, to, at some degree, given direction from the people who have more experience. And they want to be held accountable to the people that they have, that, that have more experience because ultimately, well, maybe not in the moment, there's a pull to complete freedom and chaos. There's a deeper pull towards order and experience and growth and people know that the way to grow is to be able to take marching orders and to take structure from uh people who have been through this and who have more experience and who are really at the end of the day watching out for me and have my back um and if the company grows and the company does better then everyone does better so that is cert- I fi- I found that very I found that piece a big challenge in this whole process like speaking to people and and like like look that's not the right way to handle that situation like you should not have been doing all that work you're no longer the one like you now have the resources you have the responsibility that like you have to be able to send a message to somebody and say that's not acceptable uh, or this is how I'd like to see it done or I understand your perspective but we're going to do it this way anyway um I saw a really great post on LinkedIn by Ray Dalio which got a lot of blowback and I love posts I love posts by him that get a lot of blowback because like people just don't get it he was talking about a meritocracy and he's like a meritocracy by definition doesn't mean a free for all by definition it means a certain weighing of of um value to people who deserve more merit for their ideas because like he was talking against this whole culture of like well let's just have a big company wide thing we'll invite everybody we'll invite the ceo we'll invite the director we'll invite we'll invite the mailman we'll invite the interns and everyone's ideas count the same He's like that's ridiculous. He's like no company really operates that way outside of a social media post. He said you should hear everybody's ideas. But at the end of the day, if if Nadal gives me a technique for pronating my forearm to get more top spin and you give me an idea, you give me a separate idea for getting more top spin on a on a on a forehand shot, like no, like like there's a there's an embedded va- additional value to that coming from Rafa. So that's what Ray Dalio was saying. And and that i think what that idea helps people to 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 have the confidence to be more assertive it's like no like i have the experience and and you your idea is valued but in the moment there's a deadline there's work you have to do it this way like or or that person has the autonomy to say like okay i i hear the ideas and i'm going to do it this way but like there's an ownership i think that the the key here is adding clarity to everything that we do so clarity about roles and responsibilities and expectations uh clarity about process and then to your point like people respond really well when there's clarity about what is expected of them of hey i need this xyz deliverable by 5 p.m. today i think that that's really what people want 
And I think in, in what I've been observing over the last several months is that what causes the most amount of stress for our team are things that lack clarity. It's when you give them a project and say, hey, look, we want to learn, you know, we want to do a market research project for this client. And that's all you tell them. And they're like, what? What does that mean? Like, and all of a sudden it's like all the ambiguity of, but if it's like, okay, I want a competitive matrix and I want you to look at, you know, addressable market size. And if you're just a little bit more specific about what you're expecting out of them, then they're being put in a position where they can think more clearly and confidently um, and they'll be set up for success. So whether it's giving direction or giving clarity to, um, you know, who is responsible for what and what does this title mean and how do these teams work together? I really do think that that is the main, main way to uh, have accountability and also to be increase efficiencies throughout an organization. Yeah. And then there's like a transition that happens with like people who start off by fundamentally they're, they're given the clarity. And then at a certain point, as a person transitions up in the organizational structure, they have to be able to handle the stress of living in the unclarity and creating the clarity. So typically like in the beginning, like that was where I was sitting was like, okay, like making every decision, saying how this is going to go, you stepped up and, and became another person that really lived in all the murkiness and all the, and creating clarity. Now it's, 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 it's absolutely a, a, it's, it's like a qualitatively different level of stress. It's not about workload. It's, it's, if you're, it's, if you're responsible for figuring out the solutions to, to unclear problems or to complicated problems, which is this synonymous with saying like you're responsible for creating the clarity, that's a mental load that is, totally different than the load of, I have my day from nine to five, I'm chocked full with meetings and calls and tasks. Like it's much, it's, it is, there's a certain sense of real comfort and, and guidance. Like, you know, somebody's illuminated the path in front of me. I just need to follow along. It's not going to be easy. It's hard. I have to think, okay. But when you have to design the systems and you have to take responsibility for handling and, and now, um, helping other team members understand clearly what the direction should be that takes a real adjustment. And that's when you, a person has to learn how to delegate and to think and to be assertive. And, and like, I was talking to a team member last night about a new client that we signed. And, um, she was asking, like, you know, I'm just very stressed out about this. Like, I, don't, my, I was like, what are you stressed out about? She's like, I'm not really sure. Like I, I have no time. I said, well, do you understand exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing for this account? And she says, no. So I said, okay, so that's what you have to do. You need to get clarity on exactly, and, and so you need to go to Patrick and say, what specifically do you see me doing here? And if not, you, you go to Patrick and say, here's three or four different options that I see myself doing here. And there are four, three or four very clear boundaried um, roles. You know, the, which one do you think I should do? And I, and I said, if you do that, you'll see, like, you'll be much less stressed out. You'll, you'll figure out that you have the time and you'll figure yeah. out your time management and like everything else will fall into place. So I think I agree with you that the clarity piece is, is big and it's difficult because in the agency world, it's very hard to find, it's very, it's very hard to find that clarity because every single client's different. Every, even within every client, every week is different. You know, like the way you have to speak and the relationships and the way you communicate is different. There's not, there's nothing heuristic about what we do. So, um, yeah, it's a fun quagmire Definitely. to find ourselves in. So to, to kind of explain the, to, to jump forward and to explain the clarity piece and to explain, I think, what is the, the org chart that we're looking at right now, it's a moving target. And I think what was important about this whole process is whether it was defining our organizational structure uh, or the future organizational structure uh, or defining you know, the role of how we're going to build individual account teams, or if it's this state of the union address that was talking about expectations and culture. Um, all these things at some point we, we wanted to like, okay, we have enough of this. It's not 100% complete, but we're going to tie a bow on it for now. And we're going to move on to the next thing. And again, that's clarity, right? That's okay. We're going to put this, we're going to, we've now finished this project for now. Let's move on to the next one. So where we've landed so far is that we basically have, um, I think four, like different divisions of the company, right? So we have um, client service, which is sort of like, you know, working very closely with the clients, so on and so forth. 
We have the strategy team that is supporting the client service team to do good work for the clients. We have our uh, emerging analytics team, which is sort of like a, a think tank within our company that's helping solve a lot of really complicated problems for deep rooted analysis. That is uh, sort of like a, a pet project of all of ours. And then the last piece is a mold of business or traditional business development and then like some of the marketing work that we've done. So we're referring to that as our marketing department. And it's, it's sort of funny, like we've been having a lot of these conversations about like where we need to go. And we got to a point that we were like, oh, we need a marketing department. Like we're a marketing company and I guess we need a marketing department, which sounds very odd. And then without even realizing it, it was like, oh yeah. And like, we already have someone that works in the marketing department. It's Danielle. She like, we just have never acknowledged it. Um, so that was great. <laughs> so over the last couple months, we've, this is one of the things we've been trying to figure out is like, what does adventure media's marketing department look like? Um, so Danielle has taken the responsibility of, of helping, um, like kind of generate a lot of those conversations and a lot of the ideas. So Danielle, I want to, I want to put the, the onus on you. Can you just sort of describe um, a little bit about what that has been like and how you've tackled this challenge and what you see should be the direction that we move in? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like the past nine months have gone by so quickly and it's difficult when you're in the thick of it to really see the big picture more often than not. So I think what was happening over the past six months really is that I was getting so ingrained in just doing my daily tasks that I lost sight of the big picture. And I think like not enough conversations were happening of like, okay, what is my purpose here at this company? And like, what is the ultimate goal of whatever marketing department that we develop? And you know, when I was first hired, like that really was the conversation. Like you're going to take ownership over this thing called content and you're going to develop it. But I think like throughout the course of time, like, you know, my daily tasks became social media, podcasts, uh, getting case studies up, uh, writing a newsletter that like my, my mindset was not okay. Like where are we going and how are we going to get there? So I think over the past few weeks, like what I've made an effort to do with you both is really get a better understanding of the big picture. Like, where are we going and how are we going to get there in terms of content and marketing? Um, because really they're, they're one and the same content is just a vehicle in which, you know, marketing can be accomplished on a wider level. So, um, I think it's been great timing too, as we, you know, have been talking about as a company, like how are we going to develop and get to the next stage in our growth? So, um, I think the conversations surrounding, you know, where does content fit into the inbound marketing piece of the puzzle? And like, how are we going to leverage all of our different content uh, platforms and channels to accomplish our ultimate goal of generating inbound leads and uh, raising awareness for who we are as a brand and, you know, building credibility in the general digital advertising space. Um, so I think those initial conversations have been really helpful. I've been putting together a plan um, mainly for my own purposes, because I think it's really helpful to have something in writing to help guide like, okay, this is where my mind was at in June. In August, I wanted to turn to that and say, okay, have we actually accomplished everything that I laid out here? Like, where are we? What are, you know, various points of accountability that I can hold myself to and where can I, you know, in the grand scheme of the company, um, you know, fit in in terms of, okay, like, am I doing work? Is the work good? Is it accomplishing the goals that we have laid out? Um, so there's a lot there to unpack, but I think, you know, the timing of organizational development and my own piece in the like marketing content realm, um, it's gone hand in hand. Absolutely. So the, so we actually have, uh, someone that's going to be jumping on to close out this conversation. So Danielle, one of the things that you outlined to us was that we have a need for somebody to come in and fill a director of marketing role. So I want to introduce you to the person that is going to be stepping into that role. Are you Man, serious? Isaac, do you want to explain what, what's happening right now? Yeah. <laughs> I think you just well, did. This feels like an ambush. I'm so excited. So, so. <laughs> For, for the listener that might not have any idea what's actually happening right now, but we completely just surprised Danielle with 
news that we've been keeping secret for basically a month at this point. Our good, our dear friend Ari Piritinsky, who some of you for our avid listeners um, might recognize from his exit podcast, is now back for an entrance podcast. Um, Ari joined Adventure Media about seven years ago. Uh, he's one of the very first hires. And um, I wish I could have, I wish I had some pictures pulled up to show you what he looked like seven years ago. Um, but I was sharing some pictures with him the other day. And he, like, we, like we spoke about in the, in the last podcast, Ari um, developed an, an enormous part of his career and his professional life um, and his, his life overall with Adventure Media and our growing team. And it was a, a core pillar of, of the growth and the culture of our company. Ari left us. 159 days ago to uh, pursue a very exciting and interesting uh, career opportunity. And um, we left with uh, hugs and tears in our eyes. And um, now 159 late days later, um, Ari's returning. He's coming back to Adventure Media uh, full time to be our director of marketing. Um, a role which I think is, cannot really be filled by anyone other than him. And um, I think, I think he. I hope he's as excited as as we are, and we have been over the last couple of weeks uh, discussing this and, and finalizing these plans. Um, but Danielle, it's pretty major news, no? I'm like gonna cry. This is so exciting. Ari, Ooh. party, party, party. Yeah, party. I'm I'm excited too. I don't know if I'm gonna cry just yet, but I'm excited too. The crying will come a few months into rejoining Adventures, I'm sure. <laughs> Both good tears and bad, I'm sure. So Ari, Ari, tell us tell us a little bit tell us a little bit about the last 159 days. Um, some of the things that you've learned and and what what's what's gonna happen? What's Adventure Media gonna experience um, as we strap in our and buckle our seatbelts um, and roll out the red carpet? Sure. So there's definitely been a lot of sadness. Uh, just being away from adventure from the last 159 days, but who's counting? Um, I took a nice pit stop uh, along the way, but there were a lot of things that were um, were learned. A lot of a lot of eye-opening experiences that I've had, um, and the wheels have been turning about how I can implement a lot of what I've learned over the last, you know, let's say six-month boot camp at Adventure Media, where prior to that we weren't really ever thinking in this kind of way. Um, and again, I, I wasn't on the first part of this podcast, but just in my history at, at Adventure, we've done really well with a lot of, of the inbound strategies that we've had, and we've developed a lot of content, educational content. We've got our name out there, and we had a lot of people coming through, a lot of companies that we've signed, all came to us looking for our help. And where I came from over the last six months Things were done so different, almost the opposite, where they infused this intentionality into everything they did around who they actually wanted as a client, what, what, were, what were those companies, and then devised a plan to go out and get those companies as clients. And I use the word in, in, intentionality because that's really what drove everything they did. They understood the product that they had, and they're, they're, they figured out what problems their target market has and devised a plan that included content, that included outreach, specific process-driven outreach, um, and, and follow-up, and reporting, and metrics, and accountability, and everything that, that we need to do at Adventure to kind of go down this path. And it was just very exciting for me to experience that, and not only experience it, but experience it in a really, really big way, in an exciting way, for Adventure Media. And I've been talking to Isaac and I've been talking to Patrick about this over the last month or so. And we've, we've, we've been talking excitedly a lot of times late at night, admittedly Isaac over some good bourbon, uh, but really excitedly about what this can actually do to propel and kind of light the fires uh, on the engines that Adventure Media already has running. And, and, and to me, it's just something that's extremely, extremely exciting. And I, I really couldn't be, be happier to come to, to be coming back and, and, and jumping into this role. So Danielle, <clears throat> it seems as if you now have some firepower to do some of the things that you were outlining to us over the last couple of weeks. And uh, in terms of where we're at in this whole conversation about org charts and where we're going next, um, we've now added 
a really, really significant piece to what we were looking for. So what do you think? This is so exciting. I am so glad you ambushed me because really the emotions are just pouring through. Um, this is, <laughs> this is a game changer. I like, seriously, we had this idea last weekend to, to do this. And I was like, this sounds like the cheesiest way to do any of this but we're just going to go all in and we're going to, we're going to surprise Danielle on a live, on an actual podcast with it. So I love a good surprise. This definitely did not disappoint. <laughs> Incredible. Well, Ari, right, thank you for dropping on, dropping on. Um, I think that's all we have. I mean, as, as far as there's a lot more that we're, we're going to be talking about on this topic. Um, there's so many other conversations that have been taking place that I think will, will translate into for future episodes. But I think for now we can put a lid on this. Um, I'm super excited uh, about being able to share this news with the rest of the team and even the community. We, we've had a lot of other people that have been avid fans of the podcast that have been checking in on um, on these types of developments. Yeah. So I think it's really awesome, and I'm really glad to be able to share it with everyone. Just to jump in there, I would say that I'm I'm excited, and I think over the next <laughs> over over the next few months, I hope I can jump on the podcast and update people on the development of the, of the department and the learnings that we have and what we're seeing. And, and I think that will kind of help bring people in even deeper into what's going on at Adventure Media. And I, I'm excited for that part as well. I've learned a lot um, over the last year or so about person organization fit. It's a real thing. You, it's not just about skill set. I and mean, we've always known this and we've always seen this with, with the, but it, it's, it's so important. People who really fit the like the ethos of the company, the personality, the culture of the company. Um, it's it's night and day as far as being able to fill a role and to do a job well. Um, and everything that Ari's been talking about is it's imperative that Adventure Media incorporates it. And I and I really feel that that Ari's the not a right man for the job, but the man for the job. Um, so it's extremely exciting. It's a huge boost of energy and optimism because the beginning of this year, we tried replacing Ari and we went through different models and um, nothing really seemed to work. And it was just like a feeling of burnout. It's like, okay, I guess we're going to just have to do this and, and band-aid everything together and do the best we can. Um, and it couldn't have come at a better, better time with Patrick spearheading the operational effort to create a, 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 an architecture that could allow it to scale. And then Ari coming in to pick up the slack with actually filling that that organizational structure with paying clients, uh, which is which is rather which is quite important. So it's a, a piece that we seem to have forgot about and not really no one likes to talk about, but it's it's a pretty important piece of the puzzle. So uh, it's exciting, and I'm, I'm as optimistic as I have ever been. Patrick, cool. um, what's the best place to hide a dead body? Uh, the second page of Google. We'll just keep it at that for now. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you all on the next episode.